It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Maitri Jagadishan, who is Assistant Professor in the Department of Anthropology at Santa Clara University. Her research is focused on the social and economic experiences of Tamil women uh, in tea plantation residents and workers in Sri Lanka. She holds a PhD in cultural anthropology from Columbia University and has received grants from the National Science Foundation, American Association for University Women, and the American Institute for Sri Lankan Studies. Her talk today is titled Cooley Poesies, Plantation Sounds and Labor Heritage on Sri Lanka's Tea Estates. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Professor Jagadishan. Thank you so much. Uh, it's the last speaker. I hope that you stay engaged and here. And it's so nice to. Uh, I want to thank Catherine, uh, Lynn. You know, organizing what is truly a beautiful event, um, bringing together science, culture, society, and thinking about tea in this way has been really rewarding for me. And ooh, this is keeps popping up. <laughs> So I've, I've, you know, what began in our morning thinking about taste, and I really appreciated Wing Chi your uh, anecdote about your the tea master holding kind of to you know the smell and then holding it then to his ear. And today I speak about sound. Uh, so we began there, and then we conclude with these three beautiful speakers um, before me, um, where we learn about the sensory life of tea its socio-ecological manifestations as seen in Selena's presentation on production and quality, its archeological and linguistic signifiers as reflected in Victor's work, what endures in the material. And lastly, in um, Kaishin's work on scientific and cultural aspirations. And you could really see that in the history of Taiwan and its desires to meet the standards or changing standards rather of a global market. So my talk today seeks to place the three of these sensorial ends, quality, perception, and aspiration, into conversation with what I find to be one of the most neglected senses in the tea industry, that of sound. And so I want to do so, I want to ask you what it might mean to foreground sound or sound senses in our understanding and experience of tea as a human and labor-driven commodity that we enjoy, taste, touch, smell and see. So this evening I'm going to take you through some of the sounds that I've encountered in my ethnographic field research among hill country Tamil speaking tea plantation residents who live in south central Sri Lanka and in that process I'm going to ask you a few questions with the hope and aspiration if I can call it that that these sounds will reinforce the acknowledgement of labor heritage and what I call kuli poesis a term to which I will turn at the end of my talk. So the sound of quality, and at this time I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Don't fall asleep, I promise, okay? Just a small time. Okay. When you listen, what do you hear? More importantly, when you listen, what do you see? How did you know what you heard? You can open your eyes. Okay. So this sound was that of Salama, a hill country Tamil coolie worker who had worked as a plucker for over 25 years in Sri Lanka. Then retired in July 2015, she was showing me, and you can see her here, how to pluck tea leaves on her resident tea estate. A few minutes later, she would tell me the best method, not to pluck the hard leaves, mutle edikade, not to pluck only two leaves, rendele edikade. It was a skill that she had learned throughout the years, and hearing the sound of her pluck with such precision and speed, a habit and heritage of her and other coolie workers' labor drove me to ask, 
What are the sounds of the tea plantation in Sri Lanka and the labor through which it endures as a socio and ecological form? So I want to take you a little bit, for those of you unfamiliar with Sri Lanka, it's an island off the south coast of India, and through this, uh, I can't go into the larger history, and I'm happy to talk about it in the Q&A and reception. Uh, so Selama and others who are living and currently in Sri Lanka on the plantations are Tamil speakers that, whose descendants came through Talaimannar, which is right through sort of on the northern coast here, and came through uh, under British rule, and they they came as migrant workers. I think it's important to say that they were migrant workers rather than um, coming and being brought by the British. And they came for the purpose of labor, coolie labor. And that's, you know, form of payment or for menial labor. And what they did was you do labor in roads and railroads. It wasn't just plantation labor. They began on sort of, you know, coffee gardens and plantations until a leaf virus blighted out the coffee plantations and eventually settled as a resident plantation, a resident labor community on the tea plantations in the mid to late 18s, 1800s. And so this is a story that is not only important to understanding the geopolitical landscape of Sri Lanka, uh, an island that's been dealing or has been dealt, uh, dealing with civil war since 1983, but to understand their story, it's important to get a sense of their experience once they arrived. So I worked in South Central Sri Lanka. I don't have the pointer, but you can see Kandy, the sort of purple um, South Central uh, province right here, and specifically in Nuralia district, which is an up country or sort of high ground uh, tea area. And so when they first came, these are some images of sort of younger and often children, coolie workers plucking um, coffee or picking coffee rather and then eventually settling into tea, and these are from archives, national archives in Sri Lanka. And so the, the escalation of the political conflict and civil war in Sri Lanka has a lot to do with the tea industry. In 1948, one of the first acts of the Ceylon government was to disenfranchise Indian origin and Pakistani origin residents in Sri Lanka, many of whom were living on the uh, plantations. So they were disenfranchised and made stateless upon the birth of a nation. And here you can see the result of that, which was very much a catalyst for Tamil separatist movements. And here is a map taken from the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, who waged an armed conflict with the Sri Lankan government from about 1983 until the end of 2009, during which I was doing my field work. And what you can see is in their demands for a separatist state, the hill country areas and the tea plantation areas, and they're asking for a Tamil separatist state, did not really encounter or kind of involve the Tamil speakers on the plantations. And they're very different linguistic entities and ethnic identities as well, ridden with caste and class discrimination and hierarchies. And so with that, the tea plantation industry also was affected. In 1992, there was a series of privatization acts. Um, formerly, the plantations were national entities after the British left. And so with state reform, what happens with privatization, you see a very lowering of standards of life. Um, you see higher mortality rates among you know, women and children, and also thinking about just livelihood, um, you know, the actual wage, uh, way that wages were determined through private companies rather than the state. So I'm gonna take you a little bit through one of the main issues of, of labor. Um, was the issue of residence and citizenship. Now, while in 2003, hill country Tamils were given their citizenship or given back their citizenship in an effort to deter them from joining Tamil separatist movements, their residence and land and housing rights remain denied. And so, and yet at the same time on a plantation, they still claim to have a home or in Tamil as we call it, an ur or natal village. Now this is very different from government demarcations of how we understand land and territory. So kiramam is a way of kind of understanding government or taxable spaces of land, and the ur doesn't really follow in that. So while plantation workers claim to have a sense of home, it's an untaxable place. It's not a place that they can purchase or own, and yet it's home. So very different from what other Sri Lankans, um, Tamils in the north, anyone that kind of has access to a market would be able to have. And then there's the question of nation, where they stand within the nation that is multicultural, multi-ethnic. 
And so in that sense, this word coolie is important. They become wage labor embodied. That term, which I'll talk a little bit about its etymology at the end, um, is very important to the way that they are placed within the hierarchies or social hierarchies of Sri Lanka in terms of employment and also in terms of economic and social standing. And then also this term that we hear is um, kudikal, or tenants. And so often with activists and labor trade unionists, they'll say, we're just tenants on this plantation, and yet they call that plantation home. And here's an image in one of the plantation workers with whom I speak, of, speak often when I go to Sri Lanka, and you can see their wage slips, um, you know, where they actually think about their livelihood and income and where they place that. And also um, a little teapot from China. <laughs> so. And to give you an idea of why the wage is so critical, this is an example of a replicated wage slip from a, a full-time female plantation worker. This was taken in August 2009. And so the earnings that she would earn, 7,327 rupees, about 70 US dollars, um, really do not amount to the total deductions. And so thinking, um, Kai Shin was speaking a little bit about the innovation of advancements in debt and loans, um, the amount of loans, the amount of expenses on the plantation as this sort of social form um, created and based on kinship and relationships, employee relationships, um, really do do impact the, the wage. And so with this, what you're finding is that a lot of people, a lot of plantation workers, don't really want to work on the plantations anymore. And so this is something we talked about um, in our smaller group session in lunch, in that plantation, it's a vocation that's lost its calling, or perhaps never had its calling. And so a lot of youth are going to Colombo, they're going abroad, a number of workers are housemaids in the Middle East, and I'm sure you've heard about um, the issues with uh, housemaid labor um, in countries in the Middle East in terms of sexual assault and harassment, even death, but also because the wages are simply higher, and yet the plantation is their home. And so with that, I kind of want to think about this place that is home, that at once you want to detach from, but at the same time you want to endure or remain on. So let's get this here. I don't want this to come up. So you may have seen this image earlier. And I want us to think a little bit about, you know, while my larger research questions human labor and rights and industrial sustainability, I want to think about the formation of coolie identity. What is missing? What takes form? What holds? And what can be seen? And what remains uncovered in the social life of tea and the workers who sustain this industry? So on the days that I traveled from my residence during fieldwork into Hatton Town in New Aurelia District, it's a hill station town that's located sort of in the heart of New Aurelia, I would wait for a local bus on the roadside opposite the house where I stayed. One particular day, shortly before the annual Thai Pungal or harvest festivals in January, I had to wait for more than 20 minutes. I stood reading some provincial election campaign posters, which were scrawled kind of on the rocks and on the roads, and the candidate numbers in chalk that were lining the plantation field slopes. During the 20 minutes that I stood there, I did not see one person walk by on the road, and there were th no, nor any three-wheelers or cars pass. And since I had been waiting below on the edge of a slope cliff, I could not see anyone working in the fields above me. I knew they were there. And at my angle, I could not hear anyone. The bus eventually came, and I carried on with my day. I did interviews with local NGO workers in town, and then returned back in the late afternoon. I went to a division of his estate, which was located near the house that I stayed, and I went to see Selama, who is here. She was plucking, and you heard her a few minutes ago, and she asked me what I ate for breakfast and lunch, a common thing to ask. And she asked me what I had done in town that morning. I told her that I met with staff, and I asked her, how did you know that I had gone to town? A little worried. <laughs> she told me that she had been waiting, for, she had seen me waiting for the bus while taking a break from her housework and chatting here on the stoop of her friend's line room veranda, and she had heard the bus coming and saw me get on. 
The lines of that particular division on the estate are at an elevation of approximately 4,000 feet, or 1,200 meters, and the road on which I was waiting was about 50 feet below and a little over half a kilometer to the east of her. I had not seen anyone with my sight, but someone had seen me. I asked Salama how she had known that she had seen me from such a distance. For her, she said, my presence on the road as a visitor manifest in my posture, skin color, clothing, and mannerisms was recognizable even for a distance. Living on this estate for more than 50 years, she, as a participant in group life, knows the rhythms, sounds, and textures of the place to which my presence was a new addition. I walked back to her line room home with her and watched her put down her one-year-old granddaughter to sleep. The child was restless. Her mother had gone back to work 42 days after giving birth, and she was crying for milk. Selama swaddled, swaddled her in a cradle made from an old but sturdy cotton and silk sari, which was attached to a hook on the ceiling and sang the following as she rocked her to sleep. You're welcome to close your eyes to listen. Hi. So the lullaby invokes Mariamman, the goddess of calamity and one of the main deities for lower caste hill country Tamil tea estate workers. In the lullaby, Salama sang, uh, sang about how in times of calamity and sadness that Amma, her mother, Mariamma, will come and protect children. The lullaby is not written down, but passed down through generations of caregiving and kinship relations that are not only biological or social in what Janet Karsten has called the cultures of relatedness. Taking up an interest in the passing down of song, following what Valentine Daniel has called the, quote, bardic heritage of hill country Tamils on the tea estates, I found myself asking estate workers about their connections to the practice and passing down of the folk drama unique to the estates called Kamen Kutu. During my field research, I saw only one performance of this on the estates, which I had carried out you know, in 2008, 2009, and I've since returned from 2014 every year. And every year I come back, they say, there's just not enough funds, and the uh, temple is closed, we cannot do it. Um, so in this drama, Two males perform a doomed love story of Kamen and Radhi, one dressed as the groom Kamen in the green, and another dressed as Radhi, Kamen's bride-to-be, and Lord Shiva's daughter. While I don't have the time to go into the details, into the beautiful story and the production, the performance lasts all night and is performed outside and requires not only significant funds, but the participation of the audience, as you can see in these images. Afterwards, I asked the man who had sung the script of the song during the live performance how he had learned the song. He had had no scripts written down in his hand as he moved with the dancers or performers. He just knew it. His father had known it. His father's father had known it. And he had yet to teach his son, who was not working on the plantation because he had gone to Colombo as a migrant shop worker to earn a more suitable income. Upon reflecting in our conversations, he, along with other men who were drumming and participating, asked me if I could record the verses for them. So we did a recording. We sat in his line room with a dual cassette tape recorder. It was storming outside, rain beating on the tin sheet roofs of his unowned line room home. Some men smoked cigarettes, others drank hot water or tea, but we recorded and I listened. So what I'm gonna play for you now is part of the drama, and this is kind of thinking about the story of love and the warnings of their doomed marriage and union, and here is one of the demons that are coming in the beginning to sort of warn them that this is, um, their marriage is to be doomed. The, the drama ends with Kamen actually, his body being burned in a large fire, and I, you're not allowed to take photographs of that, but um, you can see the amount of participation, and you're welcome to, again, close your eyes.
The final sound sense that I want to take you through is the sound of aspiration. In August 2015, I was visiting a local pusari or local level Hindu priest at a Mariamman temple at a nearby estate about five kilometers away towards Hatton town. I visited with Salama and her brother Murti. At our meeting, Salama, Murti and I waited for the bus about 10 minutes in the rain. I wait for the bus quite a lot. There's only private buses and they come every 20 to 30 minutes. <laughs> but when the bus did not come, Murti suggested we walked by foot through the three estate divisions back to his resident estate. So we began our journey home on what was a not a path discernible to visitors, but on what remained of the older estate worker footpaths which Selama and Murti had used when they were working on the estate over 30 years ago, and which linked all of the estate divisions in the plantation group. The paths now largely unused were overgrown with grass, and at one point here, that's Murti here showing us the path, at one point he identified, we opened and came to this outskirt, an open marshy field, and he identified, after some time, where it would actually continue. And he pointed across the field and he said, that's where it is, but there was no path. So I followed him. We walked barefoot through marsh, leeches, and mud to get to the other side of the field. About three quarters of the way home, we stopped at a wooden lodge in the forest areas of a neighboring estate. Twelve years earlier, Murthy and three workers had built the lodge for high-level male estate staff, managers, and even foreigners. As we walked around the wooden lodge, he showed me each bungalow, each chair, table, and fixture he had carved out of wood, all the while the rain beating down on the roofs. There we had tea with one of his male relations who was overseeing the kitchen and visited a small spring where we were able to wash our feet, which were soiled and pruned from the rain and mud. As we continued, the rain stopped and the sun came out briefly and we cut through the tea bushes on uneven stone footpaths for, foot, uh, for pluckers. It seemed as if we'd been walking for some time, so I asked Salama, what time is it? And she said, 15 minutes to seven. I pulled out my phone and saw she was right. I asked her, how did you know the time? You're not wearing a watch. And she said, I can tell what time of day it is by looking at the light of the sun on the bushes and hearing the wind. Like her plucking, it was a skill she had inculcated in her years as a laborer, telling her when to go home to breastfeed her children, take a tea break with other women workers on the road, and walk back to her line room at the end of a day's work. And so I want to end with thinking about the history of where we came to today and how we got there. In 1967, D.M. Forrest wrote 100 Years of Ceylon Tea, a commemorative volume dedicated to the first 100 years of tea production in British colonial Ceylon. Of the hill country Tamil tea plantation workers whose labor had sustained the successes of the industry, Forrest seldom wrote, but one of his passages addressed them as follows. And he writes, the Tamil who made the long journey from his South Indian home found an environment suited to him and a standard of living, simple as it was, surpassed in most respects what he could have hoped for in his native village. He and his wife and children enjoyed the field work and stuck to it well. Looking, as an early observer noted, quote, like a flock of dark sheep grazing. What we have seen is the emergence, after all the storms and setbacks, of the typical Ceylon tea estate as a go-ahead, prosperous, and in Victorian terms, well-balanced community. 
Now, such perceptions of coolies persist today, and yet there are forms of resistance. Visitors, Sri Lankan and non-Sri Lankan alike, often consider the hill country landscape a representational schema of colonial pleasure and indulgence. The scale of the rolling green hills and contours of perfectly manicured tea bushes provide them with an appetite for enjoying the colonial aesthetics of control as evident in the re recent travel essay features on tea tourism in Sri Lanka in features such as Condé Nast and the New York Times. With former manager bungalows converted into luxury boutique hotels, complete with replica Tamil waitstaff that would have served the white drays or masters, visitors to tea country can trek with the, in the plantations, watch Tamil women pluck tea leaves, all the while never interacting with them or asking them about their lives and families. These idealized constructions aim to keep the Tamil worker silent and in forest sense, a voiceless, toiling, and machine-like animal a mere fixture on the plantation landscape. Just as the tourist framing of a photo focuses on or excludes the native, the overwhelming presence of imperial nostalgia presents an open palette for selectively consuming images and experiencing that seldom speak out and apart from the colonial ideal. Now in that same year that Forrest published his work, C.V. Vellupile, a hill country Tamil poet, trade unionist, and member of Ceylon's first parliament and the Ceylon Indian Congress, translated and published the songs of, a Tamil, of Tamil Kuli plantation workers for Ceylon's English medium public in the Times of Ceylon Centenary Supplement. And he wrote the following, quote, strangely enough, the poet's vision or voice had not been influenced by the forces that fashioned a community of masters and servants. Long before politics ever came on the scene, however, the folk poet, the vision of a seer, saw the future of his people in his own frustration. And the poem he writes, I lost my dear country, with it my palm grove, in this far-famed candy, I lost my mother and a home. And in the early 30s, he rolled up his scroll. But what Velupile does not allude to, and most certainly is aware of, is that Tamil coolies in Sri Lanka continue to take shape and circulate long after the poets roll up their scrolls. And we see this in Selama's lullaby and the oral tradition of the common kuthu and our walk. And I want to ask us today what it might mean to foreground labor heritage and the voice of the coolie in the sensorium of the tea industry. The word itself, Kuli, has long been the subject of historical, anthropological, and political economy scholarship. Jan Bremen and Valentine Daniel most famously traced the origins of the term, from its derivation to the Tamil Kuli, or payment for menial labor, and the Gujarati Kuli, or person of the Kuli tribe, associated with plundering and thievery. Through the English term Kuli, they write, in the transformation of Kuli to Kuli, spelt with C-O-O, the distinct humanity of the individual was, in a single move, appropriated and eliminated. The person collapsed into the payment. In my conversations with Tamil plantation workers, the word would turn up occasionally, and almost never in reference to its actual Tamil definition, the wage. On most occasions, it came up to the reference as work, kulivele, or kuli, a wage work. It was an activity that Tamils would do for a non-plantation wage or daily cash income from smallholders who actually contribute 73% of the bought leaf tea compared to the other sort of, you know, what the regional plantation companies cannot produce. So a lot of plantation workers are working for smallholders simply because the wage is more. I rarely heard the English word coolie among hill country Tamils themselves, but only the Tamil form as I have described above. If I heard it, it was derogatorily used among non-hill country Tamil residents. It was as if the word coolie had become more than the combination of payment and personhood, but now, through infrastructural and industrial decline on the plantations and the diversification of labor markets within the plantation sector in Sri Lanka, an index of hill country Tamil's labor heritage of being kuli and their impulse or desire, aspiration to move away from that state of being. This movement from one place of being to become another and the combining of two forces, that life urge and spirit, is what I call using the works of Martin Heidegger and Max Scheler, a form of coolie poesis. 
For Shaler, a human being cannot be defined as just a thing, right? but as becoming a combination of forces, the life, urge, and spirit. And for Heidegger, the process never completes itself, but rather continues and keeps a human being human and whole, as the life desire or the urge to experience a good life creates and maintains an inextricable link between what a person does and what a person is. So as we can see in the sounds we heard today, Kuli Poesis is polyvalent. On one hand, Tamil plantation residents make public their refusal to give up their desires for dignity and mobility, and in doing so, defy stereotypical narratives of their subordinate place in Sri Lanka. From deconstructing their line room homes, and this is an example of sort of the back of a line room home that was deconstructed, literally building into brush in unowned, untaxable space and land. And they do so to make them more livable to educate their children. This is the baby that was rocked to sleep and now she's going to school. Um, and she tells me she wants to become a teacher. And there's also signs of life that don't get recorded. A lot of these children, actually the taller one, has migrated off the plantations for domestic work, often at 17 or 18 years, even going to the Middle East to support their families. And Tamil tea plantation residents in Sri Lanka actively challenge discourses of unbelonging and immobility to secure more dignified lives for themselves and their families in the long run. They aspire to live beyond expectations, put forth by imperial narratives of subordination, and they articulate ways of being in post-war Sri Lanka that go far beyond the intentions of a Sri Lankan nationalist agenda and the calculus of the planter's Raj. On the other hand, this deconstructive framework and their desires, decolonial in nature, they desire to delink from those former regimes of labor and present themselves as unbecoming to a fragile tea industry. And they might not yet be prepared to meet their expectations. And this industry is not yet prepared. And we can discuss in the Q&A in my newer research on sustainability and what can be done to address the labor shortages. And let us remember that this was an industry that took the time and energy to produce hundreds of editions of what we call Kuli Tamil planter guides. Tamil language guides that were aimed to, quote, place in the hands of a creeper, a book that would assist him to learn the ungrammatical language of the Kuli and help him understand and make himself understood. And in my current research, I'm exploring this ethno-linguistic archive and speaking to those who still remain with stories to be heard. And these are images of some children on the estates who are writing poetry. Um, they just kind of sat with me and one day they just said, you know, Akka, sister, give me your book. And they just took it from me and started writing poetry. And this is an image of a 93-year-old trade unionist, one of the first trade unionist women to demand from Thondaman, who was one of the leading trade unionists in the 1940s, for the six-hour workday for women. Now she was denied, but it later came up and was actually approved. And so she actually started, and this is a project I'm working on now, trans telling me the stories of a woman that she had actually recorded Cooley songs from when she was a young woman in 1943. And so I'm working on that now, and I think there's still stories yet to be heard. So in doing so, I hope to see, or hope to see what we can still hear, to see and hear, um, in the commands, in the slippages, in the incommensurabilities that remain today for plantation workers and their families who live, on, who live there. And this process of becoming, the process or the meeting of the drive for quality of the industry, the desire to be perceived and heard as unbecoming from a coolie past, but not knowing what the future holds, and then the aspiration to endure on the plantation landscape to have a home, they all remain integral features of an industry that was built on their labor. Thank you.